All right, I'll uh, call the uh, meeting back to order. Um, we are now continuing with uh, item number four on our agenda, and uh, I'll walk us through that. The uh, first part is uh, just a, a reiteration of the mission that is laid out in the executive order of May 11, 2017. It's executive order 13799. Uh, members of the commission should have a copy, and, and of course it is available um, uh, on the White House website. Uh, I'll just read it. Section 3 of the executive order states, Mission, the commission shall, consistent with applicable law, study the registration and voting processes used in federal elections. The commission shall, solely, shall be solely advisory and shall submit a report to the president that identifies the following. <clears throat> a, those, rule, those laws, rules, policies, activities, strategies, and practices that enhance the American people's confidence in the integrity of the voting pr processes used in federal elections. B, those laws, rules, policies, activities, strategies, and practices that undermine the American people's confidence in the integrity of the voting processes used in federal elections. And C, those vulnerabilities in voting systems and practices used in federal elections that could lead to improper voter registrations and improper voting, including fraudulent voter registrations and fraudulent voting. Um, is, are, are there any comments on the uh, mission? And if not, we will proceed to the next item on the agenda. All right, seeing none, we'll move to the bylaws and operating procedures. So at this point, we have not uh, formally adopted any bylaws yet, and that's our next order of business. There is uh, presented to the Commission a proposal uh, for the bylaws of this Presidential Advisory Commission on Election Integrity. Uh, the, the proposal is a uh, is pretty, pretty closely mirrors uh, the bylaws that were provided um, by the um, GSA. Uh, so the GSA has a, has a uh, sort of um, prototype of bylaws that, uh, you know, there, as many people may know, there are um, approximately a 1,000 commissions at any given time. Uh, many of them are ongoing. Uh, presidential commissions are more rare. They only represent about 4% of that 1,000. Um, but they all have bylaws, and so we started with the, um, the model and uh, have uh, made, staff has suggested minimal changes to them, but uh, th this is the uh, proposed bylaws. These are the proposed bylaws, and um, at this point, uh, I'm hoping that members of the commission have already had a chance to look at these bylaws. And uh, the next point to be appropriate would be a motion to adopt, if there is one, so and then moved. we can discuss. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. second. And uh, there's a motion and a second, and actually one of the items in the bylaws uh, is that we don't require a second, but, <laughs> but at this point we haven't adopted them yet, so. <laughs> Mr. Blackwell and Mr. Adams uh, moved and seconded respectively. All right, so now the uh, issue is before the commission. Uh, is there any discussion of, the, uh, of these bylaws? All right, they seem pretty, uh, pretty straightforward to me as well. Uh, is there a, um, a move, move to call it? Well, since there's no since there's no discussion, I guess we can go ahead and call the question. Then. All right. Uh, so the question is called. Uh, all those in favor of adopting these bylaws, say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. All right, so bylaws have been adopted unanimously. The next topic is a a, a forward-looking question, and that is, what topics might the commission wish to address at future meetings? Uh, I took the liberty of just putting together some ideas on paper uh, just as a starting point, um, and that's really all this is, just to get the discussion moving here. And, and I will pass these out to people, um, and I'll read them uh, into the record. And again, this is nothing more than uh, my thoughts on the topic and would invite any, uh, any, any additions or deletions, or we can scrap this entirely. But uh, just laying out the topic for the commission to think about, um, I wrote down uh, five possible ways to divide the subject matter. One would be accuracy of voter rolls, including people who have moved from one state to another, uh, non-citizens who may have gotten on the voter rolls one way or another, uh, deceased individuals who remain on the voter rolls, and felons who are disqualified according to the laws of that state, which of course vary from state to state. Uh, and then within that topic, strategies to increase accuracy, obstacles to increasing accuracy. Uh, second topic, 
fraudulent or improper voting, um, the scope of the problem and, and strategies to address the problem. The idea being that that would be, there, there's so many different ways of dividing up this issue. Of, uh, you know, there's activities that occur on voting day. There are activities that might occur in a uh, uh, early voting stage where you, uh, a state has voting by mail. And then there's activities involving the registration process, which may be well before any voting even occurs. Um, then the third general topic was voting by mail, and th that encompasses a wide variety of subtopics, uh, issues involving um, threats to, vo to the integrity of, of uh, voting by mail. We have, we have a hybrid system in our state where you, and I need most states have this now, where you have voting on election day, and then you also have a period of, uh, of voting by mail preceding the election day. And, but now, we now have several states that, of course, have gone to all mail balloting, too. Um, so that could all be wrapped into that topic. Fourth topic I just thought of as, as one that we may potentially want to address, but we certainly don't have to, and that's cybersecurity regarding state voter databases. Uh, all of the uh, state and county officials here have uh, access to these databases, and each state takes steps to protect them against uh, efforts to hack or to break in to the voter registration databases. That's one topic we may wish to tackle. Uh, fifth topic, uh, voter intimidation and uh, consequences of state efforts to increase election integrity. Uh, and then six, any additional topics people want to discuss. So with that, just sort of a thought paper to get people started, I'd entertain any, uh, any discussion. One of the more profound points that come out of the collective uh, sharing of opening statements was the importance of one single vote. We have 3,140 counties or the equivalent where uh, voting is executed. Uh, it would be interesting to catalog across the country how many uh, initiatives, uh, whether they be um, for hospital levies, school levies, um, candidate elections, are determined by one ballot. Now, the reason I say that is because, you know, when we look at the big numbers like uh, 5 million, 6 million, 7 million, you know, it is easy for somebody to summarily dismiss it. But when we drive home the importance of every single legal vote cast and the integrity of the ballot box, we can show people the consequence of one illegal, diluting ballot, a uh, ballot that dilutes a legal legal ballot. Now, my understanding is that there are some states that can readily get us those numbers. And we don't necessarily have to go back to the, you know, the, the first recording of a state's history. We, we, we can take a, a period of time over the last two cycles or, you know, just to get us a snapshot so that we can help drive home the point uh, to the American voter that their single ballot counts. This is what this is about. You know, the, the voters' ballot and vote is the ballot is the voters' voice. And we want to make sure that no voices are being illegally, you know, <clears throat> negated. I might just mention real quickly, uh, in response to that, I'll take the chair's prerogative. We actually tried that in Kansas uh, for the purposes of a legislative hearing on a bill that was in front of the legislature to see how many uh, elections were decided by a very small number of votes. And uh, it was amazing how there wasn't a central repository in our state of that. And the uh, county election officer for our largest state, Johnson County, came to the commission and, and said over a 10-year period, here's what we have. And I was astonished by the number of elections that have been decided by fewer than 10 votes or were dead ties or were one vote. But he had to do extensive research looking back through his data, which was not easily available in a, in a place where you could just you know, know where to go to online. So I, I personally think that would be fascinating information to have, but I imagine it might be harder to obtain than we think. And, and Mr. Chairman, we, we, we probably, again, can't get every jurisdiction based on personnel, uh, time, money, but I think we can get a, a representative group to, 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 to drive home that point. Uh, and <clears throat> Again, the, as the Vice President said, one person, one vote, that is the bedrock upon which our democracy is, is, is based. 
um, and a lot of decisions are made by one, two, three ballots, no votes. Mr. King. Yeah, Mr. Vice Chair, uh, you know, really until uh, I was contacted about potentially serving on this commission and, and read certain things in the, in, in, in the media, Gosh, I don't know where, I, I, I just assumed that um, someone could only be registered in one state. I really, I just thought that was the law of different states, quite frankly. And to find out that, that people are registered, we'll say state A, and then they have a vacation home in state B, that they can be registered in both states and potentially vote an absentee in one state, we'll say, and go go to their resort state and vote another ballot. I don't know if that happens or not, but it seems like to me that it'd be, I'd like for us to discuss a, a recommendation to uh, to the president that, that someone can only be registered in one state. And, you know, if someone has a vacation home, great, but vote an absentee ballot or, early voting or whatever the state allows in that state, that should be sufficient. I don't see where anyone should needs to be registered in two, two or more states, quite frankly. I would like to, for us to discuss that. And I can certainly uh, add something there, too. The, the interstate cross-check system, which uh, all the states represented here are participants in, and Kansas hosts, is, goes to that very issue. And it, it uh, it's, it's very easy to get registered in your uh, new state when you move, uh, but unfortunately it's, it's harder than one might think to uh, deregister the person uh, because that's usually the last thing they think of when they're moving is, oh, I better call the county I used to live in and send them a written piece of paper saying that I no longer live there and I'm no longer wishing to vote there. So it's, a, it's an extraordinarily big problem, and I certainly think it is worthy of discussion. Uh, two, two things. One on, on uh, Secretary Blackwell's recommendation that we try to get uh, as many of the states as possible to provide us information on uh, elections in the recent years, perhaps the last 10 years, um, that have been decided by a very small number of votes. I think that is a good idea. Part of what we're supposed to be doing is gathering data. And a great example of this um, that I'm sure the secretaries know is that uh, Secretary Husted, I think, of Ohio, uh, just a couple of years ago, put out um, press releases in which he had done that. He had gone through and found uh, numerous, uh, particularly local elections in Ohio that had been decided by one vote or by ties. So that information is out there. Um, on the second issue that uh, Judge King raised, that, that is a very important issue. Uh, we know from the various studies that have been done, uh, including the Pew study, that uh, there are a lot of people who are registered in more than one state. Now, many of those uh, are probably uh, errors. You know, someone moved, they didn't notify the prior state. And part of what this commission, I think, has to do is um, try to come up with recommendations that will improve, uh, help states improve the communications between the states so they can find these individuals. But what prior studies have not done is taken the second step. Yes, they've looked at voter registration lists and, and found individuals registered in multiple states. What we don't know is how many of those are errors, simple administrative errors, innocent errors, and how many of those are individuals who are taking advantage of that to illegally vote in more than one state. And the second half of that kind of a study, which others have really not done, is getting uh, also the voting histories to check that. And uh, the database that we have has examples of individuals uh, who were prosecuted for voting in more than in more than one state. And that, that certainly is a problem. We need to look at, at how big of a problem that is and what can be done to prevent it. And I would just add, not that I'm going to comment on every comment here, but the, uh, the cross-check database sends to the participating states what are possible cases of double voting. We say possible because every match is always a potential false positive, so it has, further investigation is always warranted. <clears throat> but mm -hmm. in the last two years, my state has uh, obtained guilty convictions on eight cases of double voting in, in many of those serial <clears throat> double voters who voted in two states election after election after election. Uh, so it's, it's not complicated to obtain that information. Uh, the only part is that the, the, everything is with the caveat that there has to be further investigation to make sure it's not a false positive. Christy. Yeah, um, I actually have uh, put, 
potentially two or three additional topics. Maybe they fit in elsewhere. Um, and of course, there probably will be more topics that these spread to as we start our work. But um, I think we should look uh, pursuant to the, the presidential um, executive order, uh, the causes for the lack of voter participation and confidence in our elections. And I'm not sure how we collect that data or we can get some witness testimony on that. But uh, we do have a very low participation rate uh, amongst democracies in the world, and I, I would like to know why. Uh, and then also I think we should look at automatic voter registration. And a number of states are taking up automatic voter registration. Several have already passed it and have put it into place. Uh, but I think that raises some questions about the accuracy of the voting rolls, how, mm -hmm. how this is all playing out, uh, and how it will change the, the, the voter registration um, processes across the country. And then uh, I think what I'd like to also look at, and I don't know if this is appropriate or not, but uh, how voter crimes are identified and investigated uh, for prosecution in this country. Uh, I, I think that uh, resources are scarce, and so these uh, prosecutions often uh, are not followed up on uh, because of the dockets of, of our prosecutors. Uh, I could be wrong about that, but I'd like to, I'd like to find that out. Uh, I also, just from my own experience, know that it's very hard to identify uh, voter fraud when it's happening, uh, especially uh, impersonation voting, uh, which we've heard many, many claims of is a myth. Uh, I know from personal experience and seeing it in person myself that it is not a myth. Uh, but I think we should look at how, how we identify and deter uh, and prosecute voter crimes in the country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on your list, you have cybersecurity regarding state voter databases listed. And um, when I originally thought about the purpose of the commission, I thought, well, we probably shouldn't go there. There's so many other um, people looking at this. But I think it might be helpful if we did look at the overall cybersecurity issue and just determine how communication to the chief election officials should occur uh, and the timing of that and um, just the cooperation of the EAC, the DHS. You know, I have an opportunity uh, this month yet to visit the MSISAC in Albany, New York. And so I think we're, gonna, we're all learning more and more about it, but I don't think it would be uh, harmful if we put some of that information that we're gaining uh, in one spot so we could maybe um, uh, suggest some best practices regarding information sharing and security levels, those kinds of things. I might just chime in on, on that point, uh, Secretary Lawson. The, uh, the, the one uh, hesitation I had in, I didn't really have hesitation, but one hesitation I have in thinking about the cybersecurity topic is some of the fellow secretaries of state here may have had uh, briefings in your respective states uh, that are either sensitive or classified. And, you know, the briefing will be about was, were there any attempts to uh, breach the state's uh, registration roles? And so some of the uh, discussions are themselves sensitive. Uh, for example, if the commission were to say, well, we, we have an expert uh, in public testimony say, well, here, here are the things the states are doing well, but if you want to break into a state's voter rolls, here are the weaknesses. Well, by, which is exactly what those sensitive discussions are about. Uh, then we, in, in a way, have sort of given a roadmap to those who might wish to uh, breach the state's uh, secure voter rolls. So my concern on that topic is that we might have to go into a closed session for part of the meeting, but maybe that shouldn't deter us. Uh, we, you know, that may just be what we have to do. It's just and it's my understanding, and I guess this can be um, uh, verified, <clears throat> is that there is uh, another presidential commission looking at uh, cyber vulnerabilities across the board. I think it's being chaired by uh, Mayor Rudy Giuliani. Uh, it would, it, there are times when we can uh, be read into uh, certain conversations whether they be, you know, um, uh, confidential meetings. Uh, and I think we ought to explore it. The, the, the reality is, is that uh, while some of us have had top secret clearance before, uh, as commissioners, we don't have top secret clearance. Um, but there are people who are concerned about various threats that would fall under the umbrella of information that is, is confidential. 
Uh, so I think we need to explore administratively ways that we can be read into pertinent uh, aspects of our uh, exploration. And, and, and we also have to be willing to understand that uh, sometimes we, we, we won't be able to go into that lane, you know, with our, with our examination. Mr. McCormick. Uh, yes. Um, obviously, my as my job as a commissioner in the Election Assistance Commission, we are looking into a lot of these issues, and we're working with the Department of Homeland Security. But I do believe that there's a role for us to play here, and that uh, if maybe not to the detail where we have to, you know, reveal methodologies and, and things of that nature, but look at the realities of how feasible it is for someone a bad actor to get into our voter registration systems and possibly manipulate uh, voter information. Uh, I know we've heard the stories of, you know, 21 states and in some cases 39 states in the press uh, being uh, somewhat hacked. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security uh, can't define hack. They said they'd have to give us 21 different uh, um, definitions of that. Uh, but I think that it is worthwhile for us to look at whether voter information can be manipulated if, if our systems are penetrated. Uh, and hopefully we wouldn't have to get into uh, deep security issues with that, but I certainly think, at least on the surface, it's worth exploring. Chris, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, and, and you're right, Commissioner McCormick. <clears throat> 2015, the office, the Federal Office of Personnel Management was, was hacked. And what, 25 million uh, employees had uh, exposure uh, to uh, potential breach of personal uh, information. So we have to operate in the real world. And th there are real threats and real vulnerabilities. Uh, and we can't be limited um, in terms of what's being done to protect the American people, whether it's their social security numbers, their financial situation, or the integrity of their ballot. Uh, we have to understand that there are real threats to the integrity of the ballot box and um, to the degree that we can work cooperatively with other commissions and authorities, Homeland Security, and, 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 and get a, a beat on this, I think we have, to, we have to press to see just how far we can go because it's important to our work. <clears throat> yes, Secretary Lusk. I also think that uh, there's some positive statements that could come out of this, and that is that our election system is decentralized. Our voting equipment is not on, uh, on not online. Our tabulation machines are not connected to the internet. So I think there's some positive statements that we could make that would ensure the public that our systems are not as vulnerable as what may have been suggested in the past. Judge King. In my opening statement, I, uh, of course, made reference to funding for upgrades for counties and states for uh, voting machines. And here's the reality of this. I, I, I've been there on election night. I've been there during election day when, when machines aren't working properly and you have to bring in other machines. And thankfully, Jefferson County, we're a fairly large county and we've got the financial resources to uh, and we've got access machines, but there's a lot of counties in this nation who don't have the resources. And, and it's all, and, and we can talk about um, elections a lot, but if people can't vote because machines don't work, then we've got a massive, massive problem. And we've got to address that. We've got, in my opinion, we've got to address funding in a recommendation by the president to Congress, let's, let's do another funding like we did for HAVA in 2002. And states, all counties all across this nation use that money to, to purchase voting machines. So here, what we've got now is we've got 13 and 15 year old voting machines and you've got voting machines that don't work. You've got, th these machines need parts and We've got these counties and states. We've got to have the funds. Um, otherwise, you know, we're missing the big picture if we don't make sure that we have the machines that are state of the art and that work and work properly. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I've been paying close attention to what's being said, and, and it's a fascinating discussion. And I think, you know, because I know best what we do in Maine. And you know, some of the discussion around what 
Commissioner King just referred to with the, with the voting machine breakdowns. We don't have voting machines in Maine. We, have, we use you know, optical scan tabulators. But it's happened a couple times that a tabulator breaks down. And because you know, we are a paper ballot state, you know, our town clerks always have the ap option of hauling out the old wooden ballot box and have people cast them into the ballot box until such time as a technician can fix that machine and, and get the opt optical scan tabulation. One of the things that comes to my mind is this issue of chain of custody, you know, and the, the discussion around fraudulent activity or the illegal activity. And, and that boils down to the overt act of committing a crime. And, um, and that's a little bit tougher to discern, you know, and, and in my prior life uh, in public service, I spent six years as chair of our Fish and Wildlife Committee. And one of the discussions that came from our Supreme Court was how you define the illegal activity. And of course, it's been illegal since 1914 in Maine to, to jack deer at night. <laughs> but you can have, pursuant to the Supreme Court, you can have a, a firearm in the woods where deer jumping all around you, you can have ammunition, you can have a light, and you can be there at three in the morning. It's not until you shine the tree line or fire the shot that you've committed a crime. And you know, when we had a, a disputed election just a few years ago in a Senate district, over 25,000 ballots cast, and there was a seven vote margin, and there was a recount, and uh, I showed up the recount just as it got started, and my intrepid deputy, uh, Julie Flynn, who many of you know her from around the country, she goes to a lot of your states and is an expert on these issues. I walked in and she said, this one town, the town of Long Island, had made a mistake, and they missed counting 21 ballots. Well, when we all were said and done, the margin had flipped by 14 votes. Those 21 ballots made a difference. And the challenger, who apparently had started to win the election and now was losing the election, you know, I was at the grocery store, calls me, the lawyer calls me up and said, we just want to maybe put this whole thing to bed. We want to check the incoming voter list, which matches up the number of people that voted versus the number of ballots cast. No problem. We get in there on Monday morning, and wouldn't you know, those 21 ballots were not accounted for. And that changed the dynamic very quickly. Because I can describe with some <coughs> authority the chain of custody of a ballot from the time it leaves a printing press to when it's sealed in a ballot box. And while we identified that pretty articulately, it's like, where did these 21 ballots come from? And it raised a lot of suspicion. You could cut the air with a knife and went to a special Senate committee and when they recounted the ballots, we discovered that in the recount, which is manned by a Republican and a Democrat and supervised by one of our staff, they had inadvertently left those 21 ballots from a prior lot on the table and mixed them with another lot and inadvertently counted them twice. Mm -hmm. So there was no fraud. You know, and Julie and I would talk on the phone at night. It's like, how could this have happened? Could a ballot clerk have marked ballots and then got cold feet and stuffed them in a ballot box so nobody would be the wiser? And then the recount hit. So, Part of, you know, I think what we can maybe ask of folks is how their chains of custody work to help maybe allay some of these fears that something may have gone wrong in an election. Um, if you have an accountability standard where you can trace back, you know, you can't ever tell how someone voted, but you know, you know, who showed up, you know, how many ballots were issued. And of course, that's a little bit easier for a paper ballot state like the state of Maine, but I think it's a question worth asking. Because I think it helps answer some of these questions and allays some of the fears. Mr. Bukowski. Uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, you, you, we've been talking about general um, principles. Would this be an appropriate time to talk about uh, other data that I think we need to get? Sure. Okay. Really, we're just kind of mapping out places the Commission may go, so to speak, in, in its uh, inquiry. We have very appropriately asked for a voter registration and uh, voter history from the states. But I think part of, uh, part of the inquiry into deciding you know, what can, how accurate are the voter rolls and what can be done to approve them is to also uh, inquire to the states um, what databases do they actually consult when they are verifying the accuracy of voter registration information. And for example, uh, in counties, in, in county governments, uh, are they accessing, for example, uh, county tax records? The reason for doing that is, of course, because it's illegal to register to vote at a commercial address. You're supposed to uh, register to vote at a, a residence address, and by consulting tax records, county governments can quickly tell if someone is 
uh, illegally registering at a commercial address? Uh, are they accessing other databases, uh, Department of Vital Records, Corrections Department, DMV records? Uh, and then we need an inquiry. Those are all state uh, records. Are they consulting federal databases? For example, uh, are they um, are they uh, uh, doing data comparisons with the Social Security Master Index of death records? And not just are they doing it, but how often are they doing it? Because if they're only doing it once every five years, that's obviously inadequate. Uh, if they're doing it on a more frequent basis, uh, then it may be adequate. Um, there are also other databases that I know many states are not consulting, um, and even those that are have been, apparently have run into huge problems of red tape, and by that I mean uh, for example, the databases at the Department of Homeland Security that have information on all non-citizens who are legally in the United States and information on all individuals who are illegally in the United States who have been detained and a record has been created. Uh, that's obviously an important issue um, to know whether, one, they are, they are uh, accessing those databases and whether they're able to do it easily or whether they're running into red tape with the federal government. Uh, we also, I think, need to gather data from other sources to see what other information is out there that could help states. And I'll give you several examples of what I mean, for example. Um, more than a decade ago, the uh, Government Accountability Office did a report in which they looked at what other kind of information is available that could help um, election officials with their voter registration list. Uh, they checked with several federal district courts across the country. Uh, in one particular federal district court, uh, they were told that in a two-year period, um, a certain percentage of the individuals called for jury duty had been excused for being non-citizens. Now, the federal court clerks get their jury lists from the voter, the local state voter registration list. What was, uh, we, we need to get that data, I think, from all of the federal district courts around the country, because that'll give us an idea of how many potential non-citizens are being called for jury duty for federal courts who've been taken from the voter registration list. We also need to find out, because I think the answer is no, they do not do that, do the federal court clerks, when someone is excused from jury duty, because they're not a U.S. citizen, do they then send that information back to election officials, state and local, so the election officials can investigate this and see whether this is someone who needs to be taken off the roll? Uh, second, do they forward that information to the U.S. attorney in that district because it is a felony under federal law for a non-citizen to register or vote? My understanding is that they are not doing that. Um, we also need to find out from the uh, U.S. Attorney's offices all across the country whether they are complying with a provision in the National Voter Registration Act, which requires U.S. attorneys to send um, information about con felony convictions obtained in federal court to state election officials, so that those state election officials in states that uh, take away the right to vote, or whether you've been uh, convicted of a felony conviction, whether they have that information available. My understanding is that many of the U.S. District Courts, uh, sorry, many of the U.S. Attorney's Offices across the country pay no attention to this federal requirement. Um, there is also information in the Department of Homeland Security's files on individuals who apply for citizenship. Um, what are the questions on the application form for naturalization is a question that specifically asks uh, have you registered or voted in elections? Um, we need to know from DHS, uh, we need data on those files. How many files do they have of individuals, non-citizens, who answered yes to that question? Uh, what do they do with that information? My understanding is that they do not forward that information to the U.S. Uh, to the U.S. Justice Department for investigation and possible prosecution. There's all these sources of federal data there uh, that nothing is being done about, it's not being sent to election officials, and that is not being forwarded to the U.S. Justice Department for investigation and possible prosecution. And those are all sources of data that I think this commission needs to make inquiries about. I might just comment on that. As many of the commissioners know, the uh, 
Department of Justice coincidentally sent a letter to the states uh, within the last month or so asking about efforts to keep the ma maintain the voter rolls and keep them accurate. And that the responses from the states may include some of the information you just requested about what efforts states are making to verify the accuracy of their voter rolls. And with respect to um, non-citizens who uh, on a jury uh, form, a, a juror request form uh, or summons say, state, I'm not a U.S. citizen, therefore I cannot participate in this jury, I'm almost certain that the federal courts are not sending that information about this person who's on your voter rolls says he cannot participate because he's a non-citizen. I know that even in the state judiciary, uh, I can state my experience in Kansas, we looked at that and our state courts have a similar form. You can de decline jury duty if you're not a U.S. citizen. And the state courts weren't even providing that to the Secretary of State's office or to the county clerks uh, who, who maintain our voter rolls at the county level. And so we had to pass a special <coughs> law just to order the courts to periodically give us that information so we could compare it. And that's how we discovered some of the 128 uh, non-citizens who are registered in Kansas that we know of specifically um, was through that. And, but, but we weren't getting it until we asked for it and then finally had to pass a statute to get it. And I'm certain that we're not getting it yet uh, from the federal courts. So, uh, you know, so you mentioned that there are several federal databases and there might be some information already in the hands of the federal government. And if, if there's no objection from the commission, I think that might be one task we can delegate to staff t is to, in the interim between now and the next meeting and the next meeting, is, is start trying to collect whatever data there is that's already in the possession of the federal government that might be helpful to us. Yes, I just would like to point out that since 2012, the National Association of Secretaries of State has had a resolution asking the federal government for assistance in providing the data that they have so that we could keep our list uh, more uh, up to date. And in fact, that was adopted, readopted the 10th of July 2017. So the National Association is aware of that and would appreciate uh, any information that we could get from the federal government to help us keep our list clean. And I personally see this commission as a valuable opportunity to hopefully make a reality what Nash, NAS has been asking for for many years, bipartisan desire, please federal government, you have information that will help us keep our voter rolls clean. Could we possibly use that information or could you make it available to us in some form? And uh, more often than not, over my experience as Secretary of State, the answer has been either silence, we're not gonna answer your request, or if we answer your request, it's gonna be, yeah, not really. You know, you might you might get a, a sliver of information, but not any information that would be really helpful. So I, I'm hopeful that this commission can a look at some of the information that the federal government already possesses, and b perhaps recommend protocols after this com commission is disbanded going forward about how the federal government can be a, a helpful partner in keeping our elections secure and our voter rolls clean and up to date. Yes. Mr. Vice Chairman, we we have at least one state in the country that has no voter registration. Uh, and I would think it would be very interesting to hear from that state how they uh, run their elections. Uh, how do they handle no registration? Uh, we also have a number of states and, and growing number of states who are going to online voter registration. Uh, I think it would be interesting to look at that as well uh, and to see the impact of online voter registration uh, and how that has changed the registration uh, environment across the country as well. And I assume you're referring to North Dakota? Yes, North Dakota. Well, in Wood County, we've increased almost 4,000 voters over the past year that we've been doing online and uh, DMV. It's an opt-out currently. If you go to DMV and register your driver's license, you have to opt out if you don't want to register to vote. In July of 19, it's going to be, uh, or I'm sorry, it's an opt-in. In July of 19, they're going to switch it to an opt-out. Mm -hmm. So if you don't make a choice, you don't say, no, I don't want to register to vote, it's automatically register you to vote. So we've increased our voters' rolls, as I said, probably about 4,000 over the past year, mainly because of the DMV. Mr. Vice Chairman, yes. um, has that actually increased voter participation and turnout? No. <laughs> no. So no. I, think that's something, <laughs> I think that's something worth looking at. I, I do think it's beneficial because three years ago when I went to the high schools, 
both uh, the two major high schools in Wood County have about 400 graduating class. I registered roughly 100 students to vote before the election cycle. We did it a couple months ago. We registered two students. Yes, because everybody that we're getting through the DMV is a 1999 date of birth. So as they're going to get their driver's license, they're going to head and register and to vote. So, yeah. Hmm. Is that going to increase voter turnout in the future? I don't know. But it's one of those we have to verify every address. The, uh, we figured out that the automatic data comparison is not always correct. So we have got people that changed names because they got married. They were still registered to vote under their old one, but they said they wanted to register to vote under their new name. So only by doing cross checks have we been able to determine that they were actually duplicate voters within the system. So those are, those are things that we just, you know, in-house, we have to figure out the best way to handle to make sure we don't have duplicates. Secretary Gardner? <clears throat> I think that it would, we would really accomplish a lot if we could come to terms with why for 40 years states and the federal government have been doing all these things to try to make it easier for people to vote, and it hasn't happened. And when NVRA, when that passed, people did predict that it was not going to have anything to do with the turnout. But those promoting it said, oh no, this is once we get people on the list, they're gonna come out and vote, they're gonna come out and vote. Well, what happened six years later in Florida was directly because of what the federal government did with NVRA. Because people were showing up at the polls and were being sent home because they weren't on the list they said, but we registered. Well, where'd you register? Well, I registered at Disney World. Or I, some group came and I said they would put it in the mail. And so all of that problem that we saw in Florida, you put aside the punch card machines, but, showing, but people showing up to vote, was the result of that federal law that opened the process of registration. And and it, it didn't get more people to vote. Automatic voter registration is not gonna get more people to vote. It is the will of the voter. It is the value that the voter sees in actually doing it. That is, is the key to getting more people to vote. So after we had NVRA, we ended up with the Help America Vote Act. The federal government gives the states $2.9 billion. I've had reports that over half of that money spent on types of voting equipment has already been destroyed, thrown away, because as you, Judge King, have said, these voting machines that are 10 or 12 years old are now antiquated. Well, I can bring you to a polling place in my state that has a voting machine that was patented in 1890, <laughs> and they are still using that voting machine. So at the time that Help America Vote Act passed, a lot of states decided to spend the money, spend millions and millions of dollars on state-of-the-art voting equipment without thinking about is it possible that this voting equipment, state of the art, in five years, or in 10 years, or in 12 years, could be worthless? And are we gonna keep doing that every 10 or 12 years because equipment is worthless? And you look at the number of states that have done that, and then have actually gone back to paper, like Maryland did about a year ago went back to paper, the old way. So the biggest contribution I think that we could make is if we could answer that question in some way of, of what is the will to vote? 
And it's, uh, the equation has been upside down on the seesaw, all about ease, all about ease. But there are professors now across this country, more and more of them, that are talking about how important the, the confidence is in a person that the, a person has, a potential voter has, in the process. And is that the key that will get us to the will? Because if something is of value, you know that we are all going to go out of our way to get it or to take advantage of it, if it's of value to us. And it's the same thing with the voting process. It's what is that value? Now, and professors have told me this, that voting is fragile anyway, because so many in this country see their vote as really nothing. Because there's millions, we've, several of us have talked about this, there's millions and millions of votes, so our votes are nothing. But as Commissioner Blackwells has said, we break that down to the local level. And there are elections all the time that are being decided. As I mentioned, I've actually had 11 recounts that ended in a tie. And these were thousands and thousands of votes. So I would really like the, to look at if, as we know, the polls have shown. I saw the Gallup poll a week before the presidential election. 55% said there's voter fraud. Why are so many people in the country actually saying that? Then, then there was a second poll. And for the first time, going back six, eight presidential elections, after the election, there's a study that I've seen within the last month that when people are asked afterwards, after the presidential election, going back that many of them, do you feel your vote was counted accurately? Do you feel that the process itself was secure and had integrity? And this is the first presidential election that the number has gone below 50%. This one in 2016. So that is, is what we're looking at. And unfortunately, in your state, you've got 12-year-old machines that just aren't working anymore. Uh, if you look back to those who were promoting states do exactly what your state did back in 2004 and in 2005 and understand who they were and why they were doing it, that would go a long way in preventing this same thing from happening every 12 years because we don't have hundreds of millions of dollars to be to be spent every decade. Is, is on that subject, uh, is there any objection to staff? Uh, we've had several comments on this issue of close elections and at least trying to compile some information. Is there any objection to staff uh, making some efforts to obtain that information either? to the extent that it already exists online or, if necessary, to make requests to yeah. states? Is there any objection to that? No. Okay. Um, so, uh, Commissioner Blackwell. Mr. Chairman, um, Commissioner Gardner just underscored a point that I was making uh, in my opening remarks and in the Yale Law and Policy Review. Um, some of it is not within the, the, the purview of this commission, but you know, we, 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 we know and we defend and we advance the right to vote, but we don't talk enough about the, the, the duty to vote. And if you take a look at what's happening in our school systems across the country, there is less and less attention being given to civics and citizenship. Uh, and and as, a, as, as a consequence, people are losing, uh, in, in a free society, uh, the encouragement to, to, in, to exercise the duty to vote and to, to deal with any reasonable requirement to make sure that legally cast votes are not diluted. 
I'm the chairman of the International Foundation for Electoral Systems. We get most of our funding from USAID uh, and uh, other uh, allied uh, countries. And we, 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 we conduct elections across, across the globe. Um, Kenya is coming up in August, uh, Liberia in October. Uh, and we, in fact, strongly advocate uh, voter ID. Uh, we were in the forefront of advocating for, you know, the, the purple fingers. Uh, so it, it, and then we find that there is resistance to this, this you know, practical application as experienced in, 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 um, in New Hampshire. Uh, to securing uh, some way of making sure voters are who they say they are uh, and, uh, and making sure that uh, IDs are accessible in terms of cost uh, so that it's not burdensome and, and consistent with other things within our culture, whether it's taking out a library book, whether it's uh, getting on an airplane, you, know, you name it, you know, we are accustomed buying cigarettes we are accustomed in this country to having to show that we are who we purport to be. Uh, and so I, I think part of the resistance to this is that we've, we've lost this, this balance between the right to have access, reasonable, you know, to, to the ballot box and our duty to make sure that we take on any reasonable burden of, of protecting the integrity of the ballot box. And that's one of the things that we can do as, as a commission is, is to underscore the importance of that balance. Um, yeah, just King? Yeah, um, to respond, um, you know, since, since I've been in office, we've gone, we have a great vendor. Uh, I'm, I'm very well pleased with our vendor. I think it's a great product. Um, we've gone from memory cards, now we go to thumb drives. Uh, but the reality is elections are complex. And for anyone, and, and everyone in this, on this commission has been involved in elections, but, the, you know, the, I don't think the general population understands the advance work that goes into an election and then election day and then after the election. This, these are enormous jobs, and these are very complex. And... <clears throat> But, but we, can't, we can't just turn our back on the fact that technology is here. Technology is coming. Technology will continue to rule our elections. And for large metropolitan areas and, you know, whether you're in New York City or Detroit or Minneapolis or Birmingham, um, if, you know, un unless... Ms. McCormick with the EA, uh, EAC tells, you know, passes all these rules that, that, that voting machine companies have to have standards where their voting machines will last for the next decade or 15 years or 20 years or whatever. All, every, we'll need new voting machines. That's just the reality. And otherwise, we're going to be sitting here for a Tuesday election and it'll still be going on into Thursday. We have to have, and whether it's millions of dollars or whatever, in my opinion, we still, we have to have this money. Counties and states have to have this money. That's just a reality, whether it's a car, whether it's a voting machine, things are gonna go wrong. You need money to fix them. And, 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 and we just can't turn our back and pretend that technology isn't here, that we're not going to need a lot of money, states and counties, in the years and decades to come. Yep. Uh, Commissioner Von I, I'd just like to make uh, two suggestions to deal with uh, data, collecting the data on what uh, Judge King and Secretary Gardner are expressing concern over, which I, I certainly share. Uh, one, I think it would behoove the commission <clears throat> to uh, ask the states to provide us data on uh, what kind of voting equipment they use in the state and what the lifetime, uh, uh, predicted lifetime is of that equipment and how far along they are in it. That'll give us an idea, I think, of, of uh, what the needs of the states are gonna be in that area. Second, uh, I would uh, recommend that the staff collect for the members of the commission um, 
data from the U.S. Census Bureau. The U.S. Census Bureau does surveys after federal elections of individuals who did not vote and did not register to vote. And the surveys go into very extensive detail of trying to find out why did they not register and why didn't they vote. That, that data is very, very useful for answering the question that Secretary Gardner raised because uh, the possible answers that, that are given are everything from, you know, uh, problems registering to the biggest reason I think people give are that they're just not interested in elections or they're not interested in the candidates. But, but the point is, uh, I think we ought to get those census surveys for the commissioners because I think it will provide you very useful information on that particular issue. Secretary Dunlap. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice Chair. I, I would like to sort of add my voice to the discussion around things like automatic voter registration, something we discussed in the state of Maine unsuccessfully this legislative session. Um, I'm one of those, I, I, I reside in one of those uh, civilized states that uh, the Secretary of State has jurisdiction over the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. And, you know, so, and as we talk about things like voter ID and automatic voter registration, you know, we've talked a great deal about that triangulation, how to make that work. And I've had some fascinating discussions with secretaries who, who are, are in charge of such systems and, and the discussion about how it cleans up the voter rolls and, and understanding, you know, the process that we go through in issuing a credential, which is not a light lift, um, depending on the individual citizen that you're talking about. And as we you know, fought the unsuccessful fight at the barricades over the Real ID Act, um, one, of the dis one of the points that we tried to raise with the Department of Homeland Security was that, you know, we can write any rule that we want. It's the exceptions that are going to keep us busy 18 hours a day. And, and, you know, we have dealt with individuals who were born on a farm. They worked on that farm their whole life, um, did not have a birth certificate, did not have a Social Security number, and then they had to go somewhere. And, um, you know, working that one backwards to try to make sure that they had the right documentation uh, to prove that they were an American citizen to, you know, it's hard to do without, without documentation. Those processes can be quite complex. Um, you know, however, once somebody completes it and under our databases, they've shown that they are legally present in the country or they're an American citizen, it makes the completion of a, of a registration process relative child's play at that point. Um, you know, and that sort of also, I think, underscores the need for a better understanding of our cybersecurity needs. Uh, we've already had a lengthy discussion here about financial needs for making the case for HAVA II, uh, whether we meant to or not. But I think it all has to, I think what we ought to be focused on really long term, what, are, what the goals of this group is, are going to be. You know, I, think I would hope that the goals would be answering some of these questions that have been raised here today, um, affirmatively or negatively, and um, you know, hoping to, having fully vet that discussion, that the systems that we do have that, that work very well are those to, to be emulated and where there are gaps that we can address them in ways, again, um, if there are opportunities, windows of opportunity for wrongdoing, um, you know, especially if they've not been exploited, uh, we should be able to say that as well. Like, you know, we had an investigation in the state of Maine. There's an allegation that as many as 300 um, college students who matriculated at our wonderful state system of higher education, uh, but who had come from, you know, other states in New England, lawless places like New Hampshire, for example, um, were registered in their home state, but also had registered to vote and voted in Maine. And what we discovered in that, in that investigation was that, in fact, they had not voted in both states. And that answers a question. But I think the issue of, of um, registration in more than one state you know, I happen to have, handily enough, a voter registration card from the state of Maine. And part of what the registration process includes is the question, have you been previously registered to vote, yes or no, city, town, county, and state, even with a space for the uh, phone number. Um, it's really incumbent on the registrar of voters to then contact that jurisdiction and say, you know, uh, Chris Kobach has finally come to his senses and moved to Maine. Um, he's no longer in Kansas. Whether or not that happens is the arguable point. Right. And the citizen participation, too, is key here. I mean, we, we, have an, we have a legal obligation for citizens in Maine who hold driver's licenses to update their physical address on their credential within 15 days of a move. Nobody does it. You know, um, I would hate to tell you that 
I didn't update my address for 15 years until I got called for jury duty and I had to go to the Hancock County clerk, of course, with a hat in hand so I didn't live in Hancock County anymore. Um, so that's, those are some of the pitfalls that face us, but I think we can answer those questions and then determine whether or not um, you know, the apparent risks are actual risks. I think it will help us inform the public. And I agree with Secretary Gardner about you know, voter turnout. I'm not sure turnout can be our goal. You know, we don't, we don't oversee municipal elections, but we do like to see the turnout. And we had a coastal town a couple years ago that had almost 95% turnout in the election, way above every other municipality in the state. So we made a phone call, said, what happened there? They, well, they had a, leech, a leashed dog ordinance on the ballot. <laughs> and everybody in town was at each other's throats and they all went out and voted. So you just never know what's going to drive people. It's not always the presidential election. Well, um, I'll take one or two more comments, then I'll try to s summarize this topic. Go ahead. Uh, um, just a couple of uh, points uh, on Judge King's regarding the rules. Uh, the Election Assistance Commission does set voluntary voting system guidelines, uh, 48 of the 50 states, 47 or 50, 48 of the states use our guidelines in some way or another. Uh, they are voluntary, however, uh, just because they're voluntary doesn't mean that the vendors don't have to meet them in order to get certified in other states where the, they're selling their equipment. Uh, as far as um, databases, um, what kind of equipment is being used and where, I know that we have some of that data. There are other groups that are collecting that data as well. Uh, so I think that we can probably get that data uh, from, from different sources already, uh, and at least a good amount of it. Uh, I know it's been kind of tough to follow up, uh, at least for the EAC, uh, to actually get that information, uh, because we do use so many different types of voting equipment across the country, and uh, not every s state dictates what its county should use, and so some places there are numerous types of equipment used in, within one state uh, that is county-driven. Uh, the other thing I think that we should look at is uh, who's being disenfranchised in our country. Uh, we hear that people are being disenfranchised. Um, uh, I just wanted, as a point of order, to say that I distributed copies of our um, most recent election administration and voting survey to, to the commission. Uh, this is just an overview. The more detailed county-by-county county information is on the Election Assistance Commission's website. Uh, but. Uh, we did find out in this survey, for example, how many of our uniformed overseas citizens are voting or not voting, and uh, there's some pretty disappointing numbers, in my opinion, in, there. Uh, and I'd like to look at uh, who is actually being uh, prevented from voting or, or not voting for whatever reason. Okay. Well, just to, to summarize, I didn't hear any objection to the five initial broad topics that I, I mentioned and many of you commented adding to those topics. In addition, I, uh, it, according to my notes, and, and I'm sure that uh, our designated federal officer has uh, even better notes, uh, we, other topics, cataloging how many elections have been decided by very close margins, double voting, causes for lack of participation and confidence in the elections, including perhaps seeking what data we might get from the Census Bureau, uh, automatic voter registration, pros and cons, experience in Arkansas in, coming up in 2019 in Maine, uh, recent legislative debate, uh, the prosecution and identification of election crimes, uh, resources available to that. And, and on the subject of resources, I think implicit in all of these is funding and equipment uh, to address all of these issues. Uh, what databases are states using to verify the accuracy of their roles? Um, the uh, jury duty list question and uh, any information that is currently in the possession of the federal government that may not be disseminated to the states. Uh, conviction information, are U.S. attorney's offices uh, sharing that data to the states where the conviction may disqualify a person from being uh, a qualified voter in, in whatever state the conviction may occur. Um, DHS uh, forms where the person are, indicates that as a non-citizen they were registered to vote. And of course, the, late, the larger question of DHS databases that were mentioned that um, states have had very limited or ver even indeed virtually no access to to uh, ensure that non-citizens are on the rolls. And online registration and uh, non-registration states like North Dakota. So with the, if there's no objection, we've got really a, at least a dozen topics that uh, perhaps we can ask staff to uh, bunch together in coherent ways so that each meeting can address related topics and hopefully we can start to dig much deeper uh, into those related topics. The, um, the, the next topic on the uh, agenda is future meetings and 
I know in, in discussions with staff, the general idea has been that uh, you know we should shoot for perhaps having four more public meetings with lots of uh, staff work in between to collect information for us to assess. We may have more meetings than that if necessary, uh, but I think four is at least a, a, a starting target. And of course, there may be additional topics that we choose to address. One of the things that was in that letter to the states uh, was please answer some questions. And one of the questions was, what topics would you like us to address? So we may uh, get suggestions from the responding states indicating a strong desire to uh, dive into one topic or another. So uh, we shouldn't consider these topics an exclusive list. Uh, these are simply the uh, way we chart our course forward. And as this commission goes on, we can obviously amend topics that we would like to, to address. Um, so if we start with the, the idea that we want to attempt to have four more meetings in the next, uh, well, I think we're talking in the next nine months or so, uh, the initial question is how soon would our next meeting uh, B, uh, there has been a suggestion that we try to meet uh, before October 1st, uh, so that we're, we're middle of uh, July right now, so we're talking about uh, two more, two and a half months, sometime in the next two and a half months to have that meeting. And then the next topic, and I'll, I'll throw this open to you with, on the subject of uh, future meetings, is where to have those meetings. Um, I, in discussing with staff and looking at the experiences of past commissions, uh, indeed I testified in front of uh, the Obama administration's commission on uh, election administration, and, I, and if memory serves, I think that commission uh, met in Alaska. If I'm not, if I'm not uh, mistaken, um, it was somewhere on the West Coast. I, I may be mistaken, but at any rate, it was a very far, far flung place. And I'm not suggesting that we necessarily go there, uh, but I am suggesting that uh, perhaps half of the future meetings be in places other than Washington D.C. And so, um, welcoming suggestions uh, as to where those places might be. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Um, I won't go into where the places might be, but <clears throat> I would suggest two things. One, and, and Hans underscored something for me, I had the pleasure of co-chairing the 2000 decennial census, it was the U.S. Census Monitoring Board, and co-chaired with Tony Coelho, former member of Congress. Uh, and we were impressed with the data, the survey data that the census does collect on a variety of subjects. And so I actually think that uh, I would underscore, given that we're going to have some time in between, um, because folks have other jobs that they, are, they, they attend to, that we get that document that Hans underscored. The other thing, I had the pleasure of serving on the Steny Hoyer, Bob Nay, chaired uh, have a committee that pushed the machines out uh, the dollars out for the for the machines uh, it was a pretty extensive study it's, what they looked at is probably not change what has changed is the technology has rapidly changed and there's probably a need for us to be, you know there's a need for states to be competitive for a, a new injection of cash to buy these machines or to update technology. Uh, but I would think that you could get a hold of that last HAVA uh, study and get it to us. I, it's some pretty interesting reading. There's some boring stuff in it, but there's some pretty interesting things where we don't have to reinvent the wheel and we have a, a baseline where we start from. Um, given that, I, I, I think uh, that this is a, essentially an organization <clears throat> orientation meeting. Um, I know this is a little shorter. I, I would suggest that we either the, the third week uh, or the, near the end of August or the, the second week past Labor Day of September be the, the, next, the, next, uh, the next meeting. I don't care if it's in Washington or Alaska again, but uh, the, the reality is, is that I think that um, one of those weeks, the, the, the last week in August or the second week in, uh, in September would be uh, a good <coughs> jumping off point, uh, given that we're going to have to, we might have to reduce the time between meetings uh, if, in fact, we're going to have an impact in early uh, next year. Any other thoughts on scheduling? Well, Bar Harbor is always a good place to go to in September. Um, but I think, I think the timeline that you lay out, Mr. Mr. Vice Chair, is a reasonable one. 
Um, I, I would say one other thing that you know, we've talked about cybersecurity and, and getting information in terms of communications. Maybe we should include the Congress in those communications. I know they're doing some investigation and some allegations about um, the involvement of the Russian Federation in some of our electoral systems, and maybe as they proceed with their investigations to keep us apprised of, of their findings would be very helpful to this commission. Does that sound reasonable, uh, the suggestion of Commissioner Blackwell that we maybe shoot for the end of August or the first half of September as a, a meeting time? Just September would be better for me just because our schedules fill up so quickly. Yeah, uh, same is true for me. Uh, okay, let's do the second meeting. So. so first half, let's just say that after, oh, half, 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 yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah. Secretary Gardner, does that sound reasonable? Um, as far as uh, locations, uh, I. Bar Harbor is uh, certainly one of my <laughs> favorite places, uh, but but um, are there any strong? Uh, does anyone on the commission have a uh, preference? Obviously, we will have more meetings in Washington D.C. I, I, I anticipate that one thing we might want to consider doing is when the National Association of Secretaries of States has its February meeting in D.C. That that might be a convenient time to have a, a future meeting in D.C. Um, but are there any places that? Or on your minds? Yes. Uh, I just suggest that we spread them out across the country geographically. So for in Maine, that we go someplace in the West, someplace in the South, someplace in the Midwest. Uh, I, you know, I don't have a particular preference, but I think one of the easiest things that we might be able to do is um, to spread them out across the country is to pick the cities that are, you know, the regional headquarters for the federal government. So for example, you know, the Atlanta, Atlanta is really the, the uh, the headquarters for the southeast region of the federal government. That's where most of the big federal agencies that have uh, uh, offices in other areas, that's where they're headquartered. And the ease of that is, is that th there are, of course, then federal buildings there we, we can use for the meeting. But that might be the easiest way to do that. I don't know what the regional headquarters are for you know, the, the northwest, the southwest, et cetera. But I, I would suggest we might want to use that. And I would echo the point uh, that Commissioner McCormick made about having spreading these meetings around. One of the reasons is, of course, that the, the commissions uh, traditionally uh, welcome and facilitate public input. And if every meeting were on the East Coast, that wouldn't uh, make it very easy for people in other parts of the country to provide any input if they wish to provide it in person. So uh, we, we don't need to resolve that right now, but it sounds like there's a consensus that we should uh, try to have some geographic diversity to our meeting locations. Um, sounds like the first half of September is the consensus for date. Um, are there uh, any <coughs> other topics you'd like to consider before we adjourn this first organizational meeting? All right. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned. <laughs>